Well, I talked to Mr. Hazlitt this morning, and he was sorry he couldn't be here. I think he really is uh, rather overwhelmed that he's being recognized. He feels sort of out of it now, although he's still writing. Yeah, I don't think he could live without a typewriter. Uh, and he's been writing since he was 20, so that means 72 years. Uh, <clears throat> most of you probably know who he is, Henry Hazlitt author of a dozen books. His most popular and the most widely read, I'm sure, is Economics in One Lesson. He's really the grand old man of free market journalism. He's uh, uh, been interviewed many times, and uh, uh, I hope I can say something. Uh, most of the interviews repeat more or less the same thing. People ask him the same questions about how he got started writing, and and what he's written and uh, what he thinks about the monetary situation and so forth and so on. But I hope I can tell you a few little personal things that may not, you may not know about. When um, Mr. Hazlitt and his wife sold their home in Wilton, Connecticut, his papers and his books came to the Foundation for Economic Education where I work. So I had a chance to read some of the things that uh, most people don't know about. Uh, when he was... Uh, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, he wrote at the end of each year a summing up of what he had accomplished during the year. Now, Henry Hazlitt was not privileged to have a college education. He started in college, but his stepfather died and he had to leave school in order to help support his widowed mother. In those days, uh, there were no minimum wage laws, there were no regulations about hiring people or firing people. And so if he took a job and for some reason or other it didn't pan out or he didn't, he didn't like it or they didn't like him, in a week or two he quit or they fired him and he went on to another job. No problem. No big deal. And he hopped from job to job. He was earning uh, as a stock clerk in various uh, manual, manual labor that he was doing. He was earning the magnificent sum of $7 a week. Then he heard that secretaries made 10 or $12. So he started studying shorthand and typing. We have at the foundation one of his old shorthand books. And he did learn shorthand, and he did finally get a job with the Wall Street Journal as secretary to the managing editor. But he was a man who wanted to know and didn't have a chance to go to college. So he outlined a course of reading for him self to follow. And he started uh, reading uh, widely uh, economic philosophy, psychology, ethics, uh, mathematics, and he um, uh, wrote, he, he um, just read everything he could get. In the course of his browsing in the library, he was sort of turned off by the traditional economic textbooks of those days, but in the course of browsing in the libraries, he ran across Philip Wicksteed's Common Sense of Economics. And this was, uh, in the terminology that we use today, an Austrian economist. He based his theory on the marginal utility subjective theory of value. And this sort of set him going. And from that time on, he began to concentrate on economics. He felt he'd had enough of fritting away his time with reading in, in one field after another. So, as he wrote in 1914, when he was just 20 years old, he felt, I daily more and more realized the need of specialization if I am to write or think anything of real value to the world, and, in, and incidentally, of extrinsic benefit to me. I have decided that my specialty for the present shall be economics. I fear my intellectual progress this year, when he was 19 to 20, has not been so marked as in the past two previous years. I could hardly expect it to be. Had my progress continued at the same rate, I would in a very few years have evolved into a genius of the first water. <clears throat> and by the time old age were reached, I would have developed a brain like Aristotle's. Well, when Hazlitt was at the Wall Street Journal, they had little short items. 
and people could submit them, and he did, I guess, quite a number. They were called By the Ways, and he got the princely, if they used them, he got paid 75 cents an item. But by contributing these little things, which he had a gift for, as you said, uh, he, he could write. He had, and he worked at it all these years. He was soon earning from these little quips, these little quotes, these little by the ways, close to his weekly salary. During World War I, the salaries were all cut in this country because for the patriotic reasons, I suppose, maybe taxes, I don't know what. But anyway, during World War I, he joined, I don't know whether it was the Air Corps or the Air Force at the time, anyway, he went to Princeton Ground School and then spent most of the war years flying around Texas. He never got overseas. When he was only about 20, he started writing a book which was published, Thinking as a Science, and it has recently been reprinted. But um, uh, I, I, I might mention this also, this story. He was still at the, World, the Wall Street Journal when the war started. And the day the war started in Europe, the journal offices were in confusion. They all had to, a lot of extra work. There was chaos, and they all worked overtime. And that evening, as he walked home from work with this thought of this new war that was in the minds of everybody, at the journal at least, he heard the newsboys hawking papers. Extra, extra, the giants win. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's enough about his early years, I guess. But he spent most of his life at the typewriter, writing, writing, writing. He wrote for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, as I mentioned, and then, although he was really a secretary at that time. He's written as a journalist. He wrote for the New York Evening Post, Mechanics and Metals National Bank, which he wrote in, in monthly newsletter, economics ideas. He was the financial editor of the New York Evening Mail. He was an editorial writer on the New York Herald. That was before the Herald Tribune, which was now, is now defunct. He was uh, an editor and a writer of The Sun, he was a literary editor of The Nation. That's your magazine paper. Uh, he was, oh, he also had a personal association with Mencken, who's being honored here tonight, because it was Mencken who was then editing the American Mercury that was responsible for Hazlitt's coming there as editor. Then he wrote for the New York Times until they finally got disgusted with his, his uh, stand on Bretton Woods, the financial situation. Then he wrote for Newsweek for many years, and he's written, of course, for the Freeman where I work, and he was one of the founding trustees. His books are at least a dozen. He always says, I see in the literature, 12 plus books, and I think maybe that plus is one that he wasn't proud of. But he wrote Thinking as a Science First, which came out in 1916 when he was only 22. Anatomy of Criticism, A New Constitution Now, and then Economics in One Lesson in 1946. That was his first book, really, on economics. And Will Dollars Save the World, which was condensed in the Reader's Digest. When the Economics in One Lesson came out, there were the uh, Harper was the publisher. And they were planning a print run of 3,000 copies. The Reader's Digest at that time decided to print a couple of chapters from Economics in One Lesson. And Hazlitt said, don't you think you'd better increase the print run? They didn't. The book came out, the Reader's Digest articles came out, and the book was on the bestseller list the first week, eight, number eight. The second week, it was number three on the list. And then it was off. No more copies in the stores. But it's still selling thousands every year. I, one time I saw the figures, I was telling you, 10,000 a year by the foundation alone. I don't know whether that's still true. Does Brian know? I don't know where he is. Do you know, Brian, how many we saw? Uh, not, not that. Not that. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Uh, then he wrote a novel, which is more an economics book than a novel, but it's really very good, uh, economics. The Free Man's Library, and then I would say two substantial books, The Failure of the New Economics about Keynes and The Foundations of Morality. Also, what you should know about inflation, man versus the welfare state, the conquest of poverty, the inflation crisis, and from Bretton Woods to world inflation. Now, Hazlitt was not just a journalist. He was a 
he made himself an economist through his reading, through his study, and also through his friends and associations. I don't know whether uh, he also contributed to the success of Professor Ludwig von Mises in this country by reviewing his socialism in New York Times when it first came out in English. And he also contributed to the success of a Nobel Prize winner, F.A. Hayek, when he reviewed Road to Serfdom for the New York Times. He hadn't expected that book to be reviewed in the, uh, except in the back pages of the book review section. But when he wrote in the review that it was, quote, this is F.A. Hayek's Road to Serfdom, the most important exposition of liberty since John Stuart Mill, the um, editors of the book review magazine put it on the first page, and it really did help Hayek. There's no doubt about that. Well, Hazlitt said at his 70th birthday party, that um, uh, the best-selling book he had, except for Economics in One Lesson, was that first book he wrote in 1916, Thinking as a Science, which reminded him of the advice of one uh, editor, Arthur Brisbane, who said to a friend of Hazlitt's, be careful, don't ever get, don't ever get too deep, stay superficial. <laughs> At Hazlitt's 70th birthday party, he said, we, freedom, advocates of freedom, the philosophy of freedom, are in a minority. And if a minority is to succeed, it has to be better at what it's doing than the majority. And the problem is that we, liberals, in the real freedom sense of the word, just haven't been good enough. And the problem is we haven't won the war, but then again, we haven't lost it either. I might say that Hazlitt estimated at his 70th birthday that he had been writing daily for 50 years. 12 books, 10,000 editorials, articles, columns, 10 million words in print, which he figured equaled about 150 average length books. And I don't know what he's doing now, but he's, he's still writing. He told me this morning he'd just written me a letter. Now, uh, don't expect <laughs> that's going to be published. But I'll tell you another thing. I did just read yesterday and the day before a script that's being done by Knowledge Products about Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. Do you know those audio tapes? They're really very good. And this is a script about Hazlitt that's going to be discussing his book, his ideas, his life, and so forth and so on. Well, I'm sorry Hazlitt couldn't be here today, but he's in Fairfield, Connecticut, and that's a long ways, uh, two hours at least, by car. And to drive down here, uh, I, I would, would have picked him up. But to ride down here two hours, sit through a dinner, and go back again two hours is quite a trip for a 92-year-old. So he just didn't feel up to it, and he's sorry. Thank you.